There are so many different ways to generate a square wave, it's not even funny. So here's one more. The reason there are so many different ways is there's so many different requirements. Part requirements, power, frequency ranges, and whatnot. In this case, this method is incredibly easy. It's one single chip. It's an extremely cheap chip, one that's not even made to do this. It generates a nice, strong, and sharp rail-to-rail -rail square wave, nice and even 50% duty cycle, and it's very fast. But on the downside, it's only very fast. It's very hard to configure. So it's only for specific circumstances. Also, it's not very regular. It's not wild and all over the place, but there's going to be variation in the frequency, so you can't use it for timing. And it can only be in multiples, so you're going to have a switching time, just a fixed switching time, let's say 50 nanoseconds. So one wavelength is going to be 100 nanoseconds. So you could have 100 nanoseconds wave, 200, 300, 400, 500, and that's the extent to which you can configure it. And you're not going to have too many multiples, because then it becomes prohibitive in how many chips you have to use. It becomes quite stupid, in fact. So you're only going to get a fast wave. But for me, that's what I need. I don't need something that's regular, something that's super precise for timing. I just need something that switches cleanly and is fast enough. And for that purpose, this is perfect. Here's an inverter. Signal in, signal out. It's made of transistors. Do you remember something called propagation delay? So the way that electronics works in the wires, specifically in wires, you have a charge difference, like charge separation in a battery, whatever. You have a charge difference that creates voltage. That voltage creates current. Charge makes voltage, voltage makes current. The way it works is the charge difference creates an electric field along the conductor. This electric field propagates not at the speed of light. It is slower than light, but it is on the order of the speed of light. It's just a chunk of the speed of light, so it's super, super, super fast. But electrons have mass. Electron motion, aggregate motion, it's like you're in your car and you hit the gas, you hit the brakes, it takes a second for it to actually happen. So when you change the input voltage, the electric field has to repropagate throughout the whole thing, and then the electron motion due to that field has to actually change. So there is a delay. The more layers of transistors, the more delay. That's why you have something like an adder chip that has fast carry for chaining the chips. That's actually more logic. You don't need fast carry because the carry is calculated as part of the sum anyway. It takes more transistors to branch that off to go out to the next chip, but it's less of a propagation delay to calculate the carry than to calculate the whole sum. So that allows the entire thing to be faster. Less propagation delay. Propagation delay depends on temperature, it depends on construction, but it's always roughly the same value. Look in your data sheet, it'll tell you whatever chip you're using or whatever part you're using, it'll just be in the data sheet. It'll give you, you know, typical, min, max, whatever in their testing. So we change the input, the output changes with a delay. And usually this is just something we deal with. Either it doesn't matter or we factor it into our engineering. But now let me do something stupid. Let me do that. The output is connected to the input. And remember, the signal is just a signal. The inverter chip or transistor or whatever has its own power. So there's a signal in. The chip has circuitry that uses the power to determine what the signal out is going to be, and it sets the signal out to that with a certain propagation delay. When the voltage changes on the output, that's the input voltage. So now, the thing is calculating and recalculating, and it's feeding itself. This being an inverter, a nice CMOS square wave inverter, it's going to make a square wave, isn't it? Because the output is high or it's low. And there's no issue about the transition time because the chip is going to transition as fast as possible. Whatever transition time the output has, that's the transition time the input is seeing. So it's already going at its own maximum rate. When the output is high, the input sees high, so it's trying to change the output to low. But the propagation delay of this wire is going to be much, much less than the propagation delay of the transistor. There's much less delay over a wire than an entire transistor because the transistor's got the holes and the electrons trying to renegotiate to turn on and off. So that right there, that right there, is a square wave generator. This is called a ring wave generator. Each of these in a hex inverter, there's six of them, you get a nice hex inverter chip, the CD4069 is what I use, and what you have is a standard propagation delay. Go in your data sheet, pick the typical number, because it might be less, it might be more, but typical, you can treat it as an average, it's probably not exactly an average, but close enough. So let's say the typical is 50 nanoseconds. So your switching time, let's say 
the voltage instantaneously changes right here. So we get a high, it makes a low, it makes a high, it makes a low, it makes a high, it makes a low, comes back around, and it keeps switching, 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 switching. And you add the propagation delay every time. 50 nanoseconds for one, 250 nanoseconds for all five. You can almost think of it like dominoes, or like a group of people, and each of them hands a bucket to the next one. Whenever this output changes, that change is seen by this input, but this output isn't changing yet, because this one isn't, because this one isn't, because this one just started seeing the change and it's starting to change. So every time the signal changes, it goes ripple, ripple, ripple until the end, and until that ripple happens, everything's stable. And so you get the square wave. This is a very fragile square wave, though. As I discovered, if I try to plug in an oscilloscope probe, 10 mega ohm oscilloscope probe, it absolutely obliterates the signal. It just squishes it down to nothingness. But that's what this is for. We use the last one as a buffer. And you don't have to do that if you're putting this into something else that buffers. Like, what I'm going to do with this in a future video is plug it into another logic chip that does something with this square wave. So I could use all six because I'm plugging it into a MOSFET input. So this is only if you want to put it into like the base of a BJT or something. But there it is, absurdly simple. The frequency varies by temperature from moment to moment. Every chip is going to have a slightly different timing because it's based on construction. So it's a rough hackish square wave, but it's just a logic chip. There's no resistors. There's no capacitors. There's nothing. It's just an 8 cent inverter chip. Pretty cool. Let me show you. This is the CD4069 CMOS based hex inverter chip. Six inverters in one chip. Five volt supply, and I have it hooked up just like on the board. It's a ring of five of the inverters connected together, and the output of the fifth inverter is also connected to the sixth inverter, which I'm able to measure with the oscilloscope. If we look at the scale, and I make one division five volts, we can clearly see it's going to zero, it's going to five. We got the full rail because it's a CMOS chip, and it's not having any problem doing so. If I actually look at the wave, you might think that it looks a little bad, but I want you to appreciate the scale here. If I take one wave, like so, let's put this corner in the center, and then let's scale the corner of the next one to about four divisions. Right now we're at about 56 nanoseconds. 58, I can read. 58 nanoseconds times four. So that's just over 200 nanoseconds. Maybe it'll be more clear if I shrink it this way. Less precise, of course, but the divisions are now 210 nanoseconds, and it's about one per division. Zero to five volts. Square wave. The transition time. If I do just the transition time from high to low with one division, that's right on 50 nanoseconds. So a 50 nanosecond transition. Low to high fits right in, about 50 nanoseconds. It's stupidly simple, but it's clean. There's no bouncing. Like these little these little nubbins. Here I've scaled it so that the little the little nubbin here takes up one vertical division, which is at about 400 millivolts, so 0.4 volts. So 0.4 volts variance from the rail, that is well within every single spec you could possibly find. So we've got a clean, crisp square wave of extremely high frequency. Megahertz. Megahertz square wave. And it is irregular. There are small variations, but here it is on my oscilloscope. Doesn't seem to be having much of a problem reading it and keeping it fixed on the screen. If I measure it, here's a reading. And if I just stare at it for a while to see the range. So after like 10 seconds of staring at this number, I have seen 4.35 to 4.39 megahertz. That's a variability of like 10 kilohertz range, 10 kilohertz order of magnitude on a megahertz signal. It's not good for timing, but it's still good enough. One chip, no external components whatsoever. So for completeness, I will end off by mentioning that I've done a video recently on the power consumption of a rapidly switching MOSFET chip. So that square wave generator just now was drawing a couple milliamps. So if you really need an extremely high frequency, extremely power efficient square wave generator, go get one. Everything has trade-offs, and the simplicity of this means it's not perfect and it takes some power. But here's the thing. If you only need it every now and then, if you need it for a temporary square wave, all you have to do is have a single transistor on the power supply of the chip. Just put an NPN or a PNP, probably. You could do it on the power or the ground, I guess. But a single transistor to cut off power to the chip when you don't need it. And the transistor won't be drawing any power. You know, put a, put a MOSFET on there if you want. 
want or a BJT with an extremely high bass resistor because like if you use a PNP it's got high and then the bass signal is high there's no voltage so there's no bass current to cut off the chip so no power consumption which works perfectly well for my purpose but that's a future video so for now I'll be seeing you